we have been working our way through Exodus in a sermon series called The Great Deliverer. And we, are, of course, are coming to the end of that series. And uh, in the end of Exodus, not all is well, as you will see. So we hear this story, the story of the golden calf, from Exodus 32, verses 1 through 14. Hear now the word of God to all of us. When the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast it, cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you... I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two weeks ago, my friend tipped me off in this, on this new service that her grocery store provides. She orders the groceries online, and then at a chosen pickup time, shows up outside the store, calls a number, And friendly employees come out and load the groceries into her car. This is all for $5 extra. And the first three times are free. Well, to me, this idea sounded more revolutionary than electricity. Or the Swiffer. Or the internet itself. Because using up half of my day off to grocery shop gets me down. So I tried it. My friend was right. The people were friendly and efficient. They chose bananas just the way I like them. Slightly green, turning to yellow. And in one instance, they did not have the brand of chicken thighs that I had ordered, so they substituted out a better brand for the same price. On my second try, their attention to detail impressed me all over again. I loved it so much, really, I couldn't wipe the silly grin off my face, that I decided I would never shop anywhere again. Until I saw that another store, a bit closer to my house, 
was offering the same service. I thought, well, why not give them a shot? Just like that, I switched loyalties after the first store had been so good to me. And would you believe it? All grocery pickup services are not created equal. <laughs> the second store was more disorganized, not as gracious with the substitutions. And the bananas they chose for me were bruised. You're supposed to boo right here. <laughs> I know, I'm so spoiled. Well, we all know what it means to change loyalties. You switch from one hairstylist or barber to another. Your teeth are used to Colgate, and then now, or now they prefer Sensodyne. You were with Sprint, and then you went with T-Mobile, and now you're with Verizon. And I'm not going to mention local sports teams, because frankly, I've never heard of anyone switching loyalties when it comes to local sports teams. Changing one's mind when it comes to a brand is usually not a big deal, unless you realize, like I did, that the new improved brand that you switch to is far inferior to your old standby. When you're a consumer, you always have the power to switch back. But in some things in life, once you've switched, it's impossible to return to the way things were. Today's story from Exodus shows us a surprising quick change, a troubling switch of loyalties that had dire consequences. The Israelites coming out of Egypt had a special relationship with God. They were God's treasured possession out of all the peoples. They knew this because God had heard their cry and freed them from slavery. God had given them manna and quail and water from a rock in the wilderness. God had promised to live in covenant with them giving them commandments by which to live, which would bring them life. And finally, God had given them instructions for a mobile tabernacle where they could be reminded of God's presence and loyalty wherever they went. God had been good to them. And then Moses was having a conversation with God on Mount Sinai, and the Israelites grew restless. In a sudden, shocking turn of events, they melted down all the gold they had to create to create a statue of a calf and bowed down to worship it. Talk about a quick change. Worshiping an object instead of the living God. The golden calf stands in stark contrast to what came right before this passage in the Bible, this whole section about building the tabernacle and everything in it. In both stories, gold plays a role. Before they ever got the idea to, into their heads to build a golden calf, Israel received specific instructions to give all the gold they had for the making of the Ark of the Covenant, that box in which the tablets would, of the commandments would be kept. This golden ark that held the covenant would represent the very presence of God, that precious presence of God among them, and that covenant between God and Israel that would guide them into true life. Instead, they made from their gold a lifeless calf a Canaanite symbol of fertility, as if they were trying to secure their own future rather than relying on God for life. It was a tragic shifting of loyalties because the calf they chose to spend their gold on was so obviously inferior to Yahweh, the God who had freed them from Egypt. By building the calf, they blatantly went against what God cared about most, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol and bow down to worship it. 
The Israelites had traded the truth about God for a lie, which would lead to nothing short of death. In fact, when God saw what they had done, God determined to consume them in wrath because they had broken their end of the covenant. The week that began with Palm Sunday was also marked by a tragic shifting of loyalties. Crowds who had apparently seen Jesus' power and compassion at work shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is another way to say, hooray! But it literally means save now. So at the beginning of the week, they rightly acknowledged Jesus' power to save. But just a few days later, when Jesus was led away like a lamb to the slaughter, almost all of those same devotees went into hiding. When Jesus was strong and commanding, they followed. But when he was weak, they were surprisingly quick to switch loyalties, to throw in all their gold with the status quo and the powers that be. I find people in this congregation to be extremely loyal people. When you commit to volunteering with the youth group or as a Sunday school teacher, you are there every Sunday, sometimes for years. When you say you're going to shovel snow out front, you show up at 730 and get it done. When you're a part of a Bible study, you plug in and fully participate. People who sing in the choir tend to be lifers, right? <laughs> when you make a pledge of financial support, you follow through, even when it means making sacrifices. Loyal to, loyalty to the church is not generally a problem. It's loyalty to the living God that we struggle with. Some biblical scholars say that the episode of the golden calf is like a second creation and fall story. First, God graciously sets the boundaries of a life-giving relationship with God. Of course, in the creation story, it's when God says not to eat of the fruit of the one tree. And in Exodus, it's when God gives Israel the commandments. But in both Genesis and Exodus, when left to their own devices the people get restless. They doubt what God said. And then they doubt that God can be trusted. And they end up creating their own twisted understanding of life. The golden calf story shows that people didn't learn anything after the fall. In fact, they would be destined to repeat history to always choose to give themselves over to an inferior God. Creation and fall, the golden calf, both of these tales point ahead to the story at the heart of our faith. The story of Jesus Christ, who was the very author and giver of life but who was despised and rejected as the people around him worshipped lesser gods. Gods of power and greed and self. We may be good, loyal people, loyal to our families, loyal to our alma maters, loyal to our church community, but when it comes to being loyal to God, we are quick change people. We say with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, but we turn right around and by our actions say that money or pleasure or food or success in the eyes of others is Lord. And tragically, worshiping one of these lesser gods which is a fair way to define sin, leads only to death. When God determines to consume the Israelites and start over, Moses 
pleads with God. He reminds God that God has just recently delivered the Israelites. He tells God that God's reputation with other nations is at stake. God doesn't want to be known for being a destroyer, for goodness sake. And finally, Moses asks God simply to remember the covenant. How God determined to be with and for this people. And in the most surprising turn of events, because of Moses, the intercessor, God changes God's mind. God is the one who makes the quick change. Now, this idea of God changing can be confusing because often we think of God as one who doesn't change, the immutable God. But God does change. The unchangeable part of God, as it turns out, is God's faithfulness, God's loyalty to humankind. Because of our intercessor, Jesus Christ, God has determined to forgive us fickle souls who cannot help but trade the truth of God for a lie, who switch our loyalty to lesser gods every day. God has turned toward us in Jesus Christ and promises to be with us sinners to the end. May we go into Holy Week with our eyes wide open to the humbling truth about ourselves and the even more significant, miraculous truth about God. Let us pray.